Good evening, everyone, and welcome in once again to an all-new edition of the Milford Informer. I am your host, Tim Coet. We have three very big news stories to get to on the program this week, so we are not going to waste any time. Let's dive right in and get to this week's top stories rundown. Tonight, we'll give you an opportunity to meet members of Pack 4 of the Milford Cub Scouts as they prepare to go scouting for food this weekend to help benefit the Daily Bread Food Pantry. Also tonight, we'll get you ready for this weekend's season premiere of Claflin Hill by presenting a new installment of our Musician Profiles series featuring Claflin percussionist Henry Morell. And later in sports, we'll have full highlights from last Friday's MIAA playoff matchup between Milford and Duxbury. There are two big events taking place in the community this weekend, and we're excited to bring you information related to both. First, we were very happy to be joined by members of PAC 4 of the Milford Cub Scouts earlier this week to discuss their Scouting for Food fundraiser that will be taking place on Saturday morning. Let's find out all of the details on the event straight from PAC 4. And we are very happy to be joined on the Milford Informer this week by several very special guests. We have uh, members of PAC 4 of the Cub Scouts here in Milford along with their scout leader, Dale Winkler. So first of all, guys, welcome to the Milford Informer. Thanks so much for being here. You guys excited? Yes. Uh, all right, so we have uh, a very special cause coming up here in, in just a couple of days that we want to get into. Uh, and so first of all, Mr. Winkler, thank you so much for joining us as well. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, so what we want to talk about today is scouting for food. Many Milford residents probably have seen uh, these show up in the, uh, over this past weekend on their doors. Uh, a very big fundraiser coming up to, uh, to help a, a very worthy cause in this area. So uh, Mr. Winkler, talk a little bit about scouting for food. What is it all about? Okay, well, Scouting for Food is a, uh, it's, it's a program in which we are trying to uh, collect food and other non-perishable uh, items, toiletries, that we donate to the, the Milford Daily Bread Food Pantry. Uh, it, this is something that's done by scouting groups all over the, the council, and the council is uh, a large group of about 62 towns, I would say, and they all have these food drives where they're collecting food and toiletries to be donated to their local food pantries. I want to make sure that we introduce okay. all of the uh, all the sure. other special guests we have here. So uh, first we have Nathan. Uh, Nathan, how long have you been part of the Cub Scouts? Just just last year. Wow, that's great. Have you been enjoying it so far? Yes. That's great. And then uh, next to you we have Briar. Briar, how are you doing? Good. How long have you been part of the Cubs, Cub Scouts? Two years ago. Two years. That's that's pretty good. Uh, and, and back there we have Adrian. Adrian, how are you doing? Uh, good. Um, I started when I was a Tiger, so that was the first rank. So I started about maybe, I've done four years of Cub Scouts. Wow. Three, four years. That's great. And, uh, and we also have Ben back there. Ben, how's it going? Um, good. How long have you been part of the Cub Scouts? In second grade. And what grade are you in now? Um, fourth. Excellent. So you guys have been, have you been having a lot of fun uh, doing things with the Cub Scouts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. What are some of your favorite things about being a Cub Scout? What have you enjoyed doing? I've enjoyed doing the Pinewood Derby, definitely, and the scouting for food is pretty fun. That's great. How about you, Briar? Um, I like the um, Scout Olympics, the um, Pinewood Derby. And we went to the police station one time. Wow, that's fun. How about you, Adrian? Uh, I really like uh, the pancake breakfast where we sell tickets and they come and we make and serve pancakes. Uh, I also like camping. That's a fun one. And scouting for food is fun too. That's awesome. Um, How about yeah. you, Ben? Probably scouting, for, probably scouting for food in the Pinewood Derby. Yeah, those, the Pinewood Derby sounds pretty fun. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely have to check that out sometime. Now, are any of you guys gonna uh, gonna move on and, and, and be Boy Scouts later yes. on? Yes. Yeah, all yeah. of you? That's great. So uh, now, uh, tell, getting a little bit more now into uh, into scouting for food. It's It's been uh, two weekends now. So last weekend was was your first phase, and, and that's when, uh, again, all of these started going up on, on the doors. So what's that process like for the scouts? 
Well, uh, we can ask them, but sure. it, it is uh, a lot of fun. It's a big effort. Uh, every every unit, every scouting unit in town is uh, assigned a voting precinct, and they send all of their members out, fanning out across the town, delivering these door hangers to every every door and, uh, on every residence in town. Um, Sometimes there are mailboxes. It depends on the type of the street, if it's a busy street, or the age of the, the delivery uh, person. And now we have, we have Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and Cub Scouts helping out with this effort. So there's a bit of a range. So these go out the first weekend, which this past Saturday and Sunday. Uh, some of them may have gotten blown around a little bit yesterday. <laughs> That's true. But we will hopefully cover all the important information today about what's needed. So did all of you guys help out with uh, putting the signs up this past weekend? I wasn't, yes. I wasn't there. No? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Well, I'm, I'm sure everybody's going to have a chance to, uh, to look at these and, and, and know to donate this weekend. Adrian, did you help out with these this weekend? Yeah, and I'm sure that when we find uh, bags, we're all going to go, yay, and <laughs> run up and grab the thing, put it in the trunk, yay, let's go. Now, how many of you guys have been part of uh, doing the scouting for food in previous years? Have you all done it before? Yeah. 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 And was it, was it a fun experience doing it in the past, yeah. too? Yeah, tiring. It's a, tiring, it's a, but yeah. It's a, it, it must be a long day collecting all of those. Uh, did, yeah. did, have you guys collected a lot of donations in, <laughs> yes. in, the, in the other years that you've done it? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely a good process. Uh, I feel good knowing that I've helped the, the food pantry give out Food. So again, we're talking to Pack 4 uh, of the Cub Scouts, getting ready for uh, the Scouting for Food Drive, getting ready to pick up all of those donations. So uh, if, if you did not happen to get one of these door hangers this past weekend, they will be collecting donations this Saturday coming up. Dale, what time of day will, will the donation pickup begin? Okay, well, ideally everybody has their donations out by 9 o'clock in the morning. The official uh, pickup time is between 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock. If by 2.30 somebody notices that, oh, hey, they, nobody's picked up our donation yet, then we suggest that they send an email out to our, uh, our Scouting for Food email address, which it is Milford Scouting for Food at gmail.com. Now, can you guys tell me the kinds of things that, uh, that will be good for, for people to leave out? What are, what are some good things uh, for, for people to donate for, for scouting for food? Food. Mm. That's, pro that's probably a big one. What, ki what kinds of foods do you think are, are the best? Maybe canned foods? Yeah. Yeah? Tomatoes, beans, chicken. You, you took my store. idea. <laughs> Uh, and so obviously non-perishable non food items, uh, sure. canned, canned goods. Uh, what, are, what are some other things that folks should leave out? Well, on, on the, the door hanger, it lists some other suggestions, such as peanut butter, cereal, pancake or muffin mixes. Uh, again, toiletries are acceptable as well, toothpastes. Uh, sometimes people end up with uh, extra toothbrushes, brand mm -hmm. new ones from their dentist that they may not suit them very well, so they, those are appreciated as well. Instant soup, rice or beans, pasta, beans? powder juice or milk, uh, uh, foods that contain a decent amount of fiber are appreciated as well. But uh, non-perishable and no glass jars, please. Uh, uh, they may not survive the the journey around sure. uh, to the food pantry or within the food pantry. So again, we're talking about scouting for food. We have uh, kids from Pack 4 uh, of the Cub Scouts here to talk about it. It's coming up on November 4th, so make sure you get those donations ready to go. Uh, and Dale, anything else the community should know about this event? Uh, well, it's just a, it's a wonderful cause. Uh, there is need out there. Not everybody is as fortunate as everybody else. People hit upon hard times and need a little a little bit of help from here, here now and then. Uh, some of the points of the scout law are a scout is helpful, kind, and cheerful, friendly, and thrifty. And these are all uh, aspects of the scout law that we're able to work on and practice uh, while we help with the, this community effort. There are a few, the, the other units in town that are helping out. There are two PACs in Milford. There's PAC 4 and PAC 67. There are four Boy Scout troops, there's pack, or Troop 2, Troop 4, Troop 18, and Troop 314. And then there are lots of Girl Scout units, and they, they have troop numbers as well. Uh, I 
couldn't begin to list them for you. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, that's that's great. It sounds like this is this is an event that that really brings a lot of the kids in in the community <coughs> together to 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 really help a great cause, and that's 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 definitely something important. So that's that's certainly something that we're excited to to hear about, and uh, uh, so it's uh, we're we're really looking forward to hearing how everything goes this weekend, guys. I hope you collect a lot of food, uh, and again, all of it is going to go to the Daily Bread Food Pantry, which does such great work here in the Milford community. So it is scouting for food. Get those donations out on your doorstep, out clearly visible for these guys for for Saturday morning on November 4th to come out and collect. And, uh, and we hope you guys have a lot of success this weekend. So again, members of PAC4, the Cub Scouts, thank you guys so much for, for being here with us this week. You can wave to the camera, say hi to everybody back at home. And, th and thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you guys so much. The other major event taking place this weekend is the premiere of a brand new season for the Claflin Hill Symphony. If you have not purchased your tickets yet, make sure you head over to ClaflinHill.org right now to get ready for tomorrow night's concert titled Teutonic Titans. Now to get everyone in the Claflin spirit, we are so happy to have a brand new installment of our Claflin Hill Musician Profile series for you. Tonight we introduce you to a longtime member of the group and percussionist Henry Morell. Hi, I'm Henry Morell, and I've been with the uh, Claflin Hill Symphony Orchestra since its onset uh, about 2003 or 2004. I actually played with the uh, Milford uh, Concert Band before that in 2000. Growing up, uh, my mom played uh, piano and violin and uh, had an older brother, uh, much older, 14 years older than I was, and he was a percussionist um, and actually played in the Navy Band. So I was able to uh, get that influence in the percussion from my brother mainly. And uh, as I progressed, uh, started at age 10 on snare drum, but it was really when I, I got into uh, high school that I uh, really got serious as a freshman in high school. A uh, gentleman by the name of Walter Tokazik was an extremely important man in my life. Uh, and uh, he's since passed, but uh, he uh, really turned me out to percussion. I attended Mount St. Charles Academy in Winsocket, and I had a great band director there, Brother Henry Peter, and I played the concert band, jazz band. Um, that was just a lot of fun doing that, you know. And uh, I was in the Allstate Band in Rhode Island. I grew up in Rhode Island, so that, that was uh, excellent work for me there. Um, and I went, uh, went on to uh, Boston Conservatory after I, I got out of high school and actually met my wife there. <laughs> she was a vocalist. and. Uh, so I, I finished Boston Conservatory while I was there. I did all the ensembles as well. Uh, the orchestra, the concert band, the jazz band, the percussion ensemble. It was a small school back then in 1970, and uh, uh, all, of, all the wind plays and percussion kind of played in all the groups. So we, we had a lot of fun doing that. Well, I, my major was uh, music education at Boston Conservatory, and when I got out, I started immediately uh, as soon as I got out in 1974, right up the street in the Menden Upton School District. And I was there for 35 years and uh, taught everything from fourth grade through the high school. And uh, the cool thing about you know, teaching that long is uh, my son ended up going into music as well. He's a percussionist and he was actually teaching the middle school and I was teaching the high school. So he was sending all the great kids to me at the high school at Nipmuc. Uh, and my daughter played flute as well. Um, played, they both played uh, at the uh, University of Rhode Island in the uh, ensembles there. It's, it's great, you know, and uh, so proud of all of them. But uh, yeah, it's just continuing. And now my, uh, my daughter's boy just started uh, trombone and uh, <laughs> the six-year-old, my son's six-year-old started piano. So I'm sure it's going to go on. The legacy's going to go on forever, <laughs> I hope. After I um, got out of the conservatory, I um, started taking courses at Rhode Island College and uh, ended up uh, joining the American band from Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, that band actually originated uh, at our 180th anniversary. In fact, we have a concert uh, this Sunday uh, for that, uh, that event. And uh, so I've been with the American band from Providence since 1979. And it's a concert band, just like our summer winds here with uh, Paul and Claflin Hill. And uh, that's been uh, something I've been doing for all this time. 
And I also play with uh, the uh, fantasy big band from Hopedale. So big band, I love big band music, and that's great stuff. Uh, and other than that, um, I do a lot of shows, and a lot of musicals. Um, just finished Peter Pan in uh, Norwood and uh, playing a lot of musical pits. Uh, and Clafford Hill, of course, uh, it's, it's a great organization. Paul's doing a great job, and uh, I really enjoy playing with them, especially all the guys in the percussion section. You know, usually there's three or four of us, and we, we have a great time during our uh, rehearsal week. Percussion is, is uh, very different from uh, a lot of, because uh, I, I play the wind instruments, I teach them all, and uh, percussion is very unique. And, uh, you know, because a lot of times you have an important role to play it. Every time you touch an instrument, everyone knows it. You know, if you're in the middle of, uh, not that the other instruments aren't that important, but once, you know, if you go and hit a cymbal crash in the wrong spot, everybody in the world's going to know it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, we have a great time with percussion and a lot of times that cymbal crash or that little triangle solo or a snare drum solo comes after counting like 200 measures of rest and you come in with that one spot to accent what's going on and uh, that's a challenge in itself. <laughs> okay, I'd like to demonstrate the snare drum and the different aspects of it and different sticking that you can use to play it. So obviously if you play just a single stroke, give you an idea of what the sound is like. I'm just going to play an excerpt from uh, Maurice Ravel's Bolero, which maybe everybody can relate to. So some of the other things interesting about the snare drum, uh, we have different what we call rudiments. One is called the flam, where one stick comes just before the other stick. We have what we call the drag, where one stick bounces before the other stick. And we have the snare drum roll, where both sticks are bouncing. So what I'd like to do next is to show you some of the accessory instruments that we play in the percussion section. So the first one is the tambourine. Uh, some of the tambourines have a head, which we use for the symphony work, and others don't have a head, which you may use in a rock band or something like that. So the cool thing about this is it has uh, a different kind of roll that you can do actually with your thumb or finger, where you just press on the head and you make the jingle. And finally, everyone can probably relate to this and have seen a triangle before. The triangles have diff multiple beaters. I have right now a very light beater, which I would play very, very soft music for. Now if I play the same thing, the same pressure, but with a larger beater, get a little louder. And finally, there's some very, very percussive music. So depending on the style of music, the volume of music, I can change beaters and not, not actually have to change the way I perform. So we do a roll on a triangle as well by just going back and forth in this corner or the top corner. And any time I want this to stop the ring, all I do is squeeze and stop the ring. Yeah, I remember being with the Milford Concert Band and doing those outdoor concerts in the summer. Um, I was just filling in at that point, and uh, uh, Paul was playing clarinet, and uh, I was just part of that group. And then, 
it started to just evolve a little bit. And I heard, yeah, Paul's going to start making this and doing a symphony. I said, wow, this is going to be great. And I was lucky enough to, to be on board and, and stay on board. And uh, um, and he, he trusts our, our section so much. You know, and he tells us that all the time. He says, I don't have to worry about you guys. You just do your thing, and, and it's great. You know, I don't have to worry about you. Um, so, yeah, over the years, it's been wonderful. Uh, and I still continue in the summer with the Flaffin Hills Summer Winds. And we, we play all the different concerts in the park and different places. And, uh, yeah, every, every concert is unique um, and uh, challenging because, I mean, we only have three rehearsals. And uh, we have, sometimes we have a lot of difficult music to perform. And uh, it always comes out great because Paul uh, has a, a great group. We have some crazy people in that section. I'm kind of like the straight man, I think. It's like <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the one that uh, um, is, doesn't get eccentric too much. And, uh, uh, but we, we all have our own personalities, and it's great. And, and we, the thing is, is we work so well together, and we're able to switch off so that you know no one uh, has uh, too much of an ego. It's like a family within a family. And uh, the, uh, the, all the musicians are fantastic, first of all. And it's a high-level organization. And that in itself brings you back. Because uh, if, you know, if you come back and you hear these, you know, what's going on, what's going on. But there's always a high quality of performance. Um, but it's the, uh, it's the uh, percussion factor you know, with the section and the, the family atmosphere of the, the whole group. So I hope I can do it for, for a long time to come. Our Milford TV producer Mike Sperling was on hand in Duxbury to cover all of the action so here are the complete highlights for Milford football in the MIAA playoffs. The playoffs arrived for high school football in week eight, and Milford entered into the opening round of the D3 South playoffs as the number seven seed. That would send Milford on a 90 minute bus ride up to Duxbury to take on the six and one Dragons. Milford would use their defense to set a physical tone to this game early on. Milford would bring the pressure here on Duxbury's opening drive resulting in a sack. The defense would be right back at it on the next play with Brendan White getting to the QB to force the fumble. The Dragons would recover but could not advance the football and they would be forced to punt. The war package would then have some success on the Hawks ensuing possession. Here it's Will Pointer breaking off a nice game to push Milford inside the Duxbury 20. Later in the drive it looked like they may try to go for it on 4th and 2 from the 13, but an offsides penalty would lead Milford to send Sean Lahane out for a 35-yard field goal try. The normally rock-solid Milford kicker would send this one toward the upright on the right side of the field, and the refs would say the kick was no good. Here was Coach Vizakis' reaction after the game. We missed a field goal in the first quarter, which, which could have been, I mean, from our vantage point it looked good, and on film it looked good, but uh, they called it no good, and, and that, was, uh, that was after our first drive, which you know, was unfortunate, one of the, the many calls that, that didn't go our way last night. The Hawks' D would make life difficult on the Dragons once again on their next drive, forcing them into another fourth down situation. Duxbury would line up in punt formation, but instead of making the kick, Duxbury captain Joe Gooley would tuck the ball and run with it, first slicing up the middle before cutting to the far sideline on a massive gain that would put Duxbury in business deep inside Milford territory. Just a few plays later, Duxbury would try to take it in on the keeper. Milford would stuff Dragons QB John Roberts and the ball would come loose right at the end of the play. Milford would end up with it, but after the officials got together, they would rule Roberts was down before the fumble. The possession would carry over to the start of the second quarter, where this time Roberts would go to the passing game and he would find senior Frankie Tower who would make a tumbling grab into the end zone, allowing the home team to take the first lead. Milford was immediately ready to respond on the Duxbury kickoff. Captain Ryan O'Toole would field the ball at his own 10 and was able to slice right through the Duxbury special teams. He then accelerated past a desperation tackle on the far side before taking it to the house for what appeared to be a game-tying touchdown. 
but the referees would call Milford for a hold, and for the third time in the first half, a critical call would go against the Scarlet Hawks. Once again, let's get the reaction from the Milford head coach. That was all Ryan O'Toole, who this week had one of his best weeks of practice and returned the kickoff in the second quarter for a touchdown, ultimately a holding penalty on us that we watched on film that you know was very questionable, very questionable. And in a, in a playoff game, in a playoff environment at Duxbury, you, you wonder, like, is that a hometown call? And, and that was frustrating. Both defenses would be on full display over the remainder of the second quarter. With just 20 seconds left, watch Caden Kelly as he comes out of nowhere to jump in front of the receiver on what surely would have been a pick six, but Kelly just could not hold on, giving Duxbury another lucky break. The Dragons would work their way into field goal range just before time expired in the half, but their kick would be no good, keeping the score at 7 to nothing as the teams broke for the half. The game would continue to be a fierce defensive battle into the third quarter. We pick up the action with five minutes to go. Duxbury would have the ball just outside of the goal line where they'd opt for a passing play. Roberts would force the ball into good Milford coverage and Chris Rivera would end up with a key interception. Milford would take over pinned inside their own five yard line, but Coach Vizakis would elect to deploy the war package once again, hoping Milford could ground and pound their way out of the shadow of their own goal post. On third down, the Hawks would put the ball into the hands of Rivera, hoping he could make a key contribution on offense this time, but Duxbury read the play well and Rivera would be brought down in the end zone, giving the Dragons a safety to up their lead to nine to nothing. After three quarters where it felt like none of the bounces went Milford's way, the Hawks would finally catch a break in the fourth. Off the Sean Lahane punt watches Duxbury's Jack Murphy loses track of where the ball is coming down. It ends up grazing Murphy's shoulder before landing right in the hands of Dylan Ortiz, allowing Milford's offense to come right back onto the field with starting field position just outside the Duxbury 20. From there, Will Pointer would single-handedly make sure the Hawks capitalized on the opportunity. Pointer would get the ball on three straight plays out of the war package, the third of which the senior would just barely sneak over the goal line for the touchdown. Lahane would finish off the drive with a PAT and with seven minutes remaining in the game, Milford would cut the Duxbury lead to just two points. Duxbury would look to respond on their next drive. Here Roberts sends a pass down the far sideline and senior James Mealy is able to haul it in, setting up first down for the Dragons at the Milford 35. On the very next play, John Roberts looks to run it himself, but Joey Everett comes in to blow up the play, knocking the ball loose. Lucas Rosa would then cover it up, and the Milford defense would come through with their second turnover of the game, giving the ball back to the offense with just over three minutes to go. The Hawks would then continue to grind it out with the war package, leading them to an eventual fourth and four with just under two minutes on the clock. Milford would go for it, but the Dragons would clog up the middle, and the result of the play would be a turnover on downs. Milford would get one last possession with just 30 seconds to go, but Colby Pyers, who had not seen much game action all night, would be unable to get the Hawks down the field, and ultimately the Dragons would come through with a sack on fourth down to seal the win. Milford pushed the number two seed to the limit, but in the end, Duxbury would go on to win by a final of 9-7, eliminating the Scarlet Hawks from the playoffs. That is all the time we have for this week. Do not forget to turn your clocks back one hour this weekend. Enjoy the extra hour of sleep. And from all of us here at Milford TV, this is Tim Coet saying have a great week. So long, everybody.